I was walking around London like Jack the Ripper, but they called me Joe the Tripper because I was tripping. We all wanted to go to the road to Shangri-La. All right, Tech Professor. Hello, everybody. This is the Road to Shangri La, an international ICP podcast. You're here with me, DJ BO. No stops, no caps, no brags, just facts. Shanghai's number two DJ, and I'm joined always by my man in the Caribbean. The shit doctor in training himself, dirty hair, Dan Fistastic. Whoop, whoop, Dan. Whoop, whoop from around the world. How's it going, crew? It's going good. So for those of you not yet familiar, this is the Intersectional International Insane Clown Podcast, a peripatetic psychopathic podcast. It's whoop, whoop from around the world. And today's topic is the part two of Violent J's memoir, co-written with Hobie Eshlin, entitled ICP Behind the Paint. We're going to be going over chapters 14 to the very end. It's a switcheroo. It's a shocker. We turned the riddle box. We did not come up with what we expected, Dan, because what we said we were going to do was talk about the riddle box today. But we didn't. We're not there yet. Get over it, everybody. There's That's a lot to unpack. Happened. There's so much to unpack in that album because so far I will give it away to a little bit away towards next episode. Favorite of the ICP album so far. Well, that'll titillate them till next time. Well, there you go. So we will be getting to that next. Um, in the meantime, we're going to be talking about the second half of Violent J's book, which we, we talked about the first half the last time. When we talked about the first half, we had a special cameo from a special juggalo. This is a very, very special juggalo because she is our number one fan. That's right. The podcast number one fan from Florida originally, where we're from, but represents upstate New York, Buffalo. Please welcome Julia, a.k.a. Schizotic. Whoop, whoop. That's what we like to hear. That's right. Excitement. There you go. Now, this is important um, because she is the first genuine, real deal, no BS, legit juggalo to actually appear on this juggalo podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the term would be juggalette, correct? I mean, I guess juggalos is a general group, but yes, it is our first some, either. What do you, go ahead. I mean, yes, but uh, some don't like to be called that. You could go either way. Fair enough. We will go with the non-gender juggalex, juggalox, like adding the X to the end of Latino. No. Jug okay, juggalette so X, yeah. Juggalo yeah, X. Juggalox. Juggalox. Okay. Okay. Right. But to that end, we'll, Juggalox, we'll, we'll, we'll the Juggalox is definitely a Dr. Seuss character, right? Sure, sure. That's hoping. So what do you got, um, Brian? Well, before we get to me, don't be rude. Schizotic, what's your previous experience with ICP? I've been a fan for years. Too many, like possibly uh, since I was 13. Which is a pretty long time. When, what, what is your first experience? What was your first experience like with ICP? Okay, well, um, I found the tape, and the tape was the ringmaster. Uh, I was walking home from school, and it was winter, and in the snow I saw something shiny, and got it, and it was a tape. I brought it home, and there it was. It was amazing still is my opinion of course um and so how has your fandom evolved from that event 
20 years ago or whatever, you know, like how has your relationship, you know, evolved with the, the hatchet family, the insane clown posse, everything else? Um, I feel like it's pretty much the same. I still have the same feelings. I love everything that they produce and put out there. <laughs> nice. And so, uh, what was your previous experience? What was your favorite gathering of the Juggalos that you've been to? <laughs> I haven't been to one. <gasps> well, I think we need to solve that because you need to be our guide to the next gathering of the Juggalos and take Dan and I. We are on the road to Shangri-La. I think we need a, a tour guide there, wouldn't you say, Dan? Yeah, a, a guru to take us through the experience. Gourette, Gourex. I, mean, I totally could possibly do that, yes. Nice, nice. And you, you've read this book before, right? This is not your first time going through this book. That is true. It is not my first time. It is, I don't know, it's been a few times. Can't recall the number. <laughs> but, a, but a bunch. And so we went over this book in the, ahem, the Going Through Pages Rock and Roll book club that I host here in Shanghai, China. And Julia at, was a very valuable part of that. And she's uh, jumped on that just like she's jumped on this podcast. And we appreciate her being here. Thank you very much. But before we get to that, let's go to the gather patter. And now it's time for some Gather Patter. Yes! Thank you, Troy, with the new overdub sound effects. I'm sorry, Dan, please. Yeah, I did it. Okay, well, tell me about the Gather Patter, damn it. What? Listen to the know. man. <laughs> All right, so probably, so hi, I'm Dan. I'm going to be talking to Gather Patter today. So probably the most inter interesting thing that's happened since we were last on air doing this or last time we recorded this was the insane clown posse has la launched the weekly freakly weekly mockumentary news network so that's their uh the great uh hatchet action news anchors guy goff gorfi and fats pepper um yeah have, are back on the air and so you can actually text them to get weekly updates so text juggalo I don't know if it needs to be all cast, but text Juggalo to 474747 and you can get all of the ICP happenings ha coming right to your phone. That's probably the most interesting thing that's happened. They're, they're getting back on. They're producing some weekly content again. I don't know exactly when they're going back on the road, but uh, yeah, that's at least a good start. And so basically well, the big thing that they're talking about is the, the house party peep show. That's one thing that they're going to be doing all this month. Well, just getting back to the weekly, freakly, weekly, like, uh, Julia, they, they did this years ago, and they're just kind of reviving it now. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And uh, the phone number thing, they also did the Juggalo hotline kind of thing. But I don't think they're doing it the same way. I mean, it just seems like they've settled into, like, all right, we're in 2020 America land. It's quarantine. They're going to have to not just delay what they're doing, but kind of adapt to the situation. And they've, that's what they seem to be doing. Right on. Yeah, it's very cool. And uh, I mean, they've always been producing content since this whole thing, but um, Shaggy Too Dope has had his uh, kind of weekly video podcast thing that he's been doing with a buddy of his, but it's kind of cool to see. It's like, this is the time of year where, you know, it's coming up on Halloween time. I mean, it's time for them to get busy. This is, you know, they do some of their big, cool stuff around this time. So it's good to see them back on. Yeah, that podcast is called Shaggy and the Creep. Yes. Yep. I know how Shaggy feels in the situation. Anyway, um, the Violent J's book, I See People Behind the Paint, was released in 2000, July 2003. Do you know what else was released in July 2003, Dan? Ooh, no, I don't. That was, uh, in that month on July 9th, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. The first in that series was released. Do you know what film studio released that movie? No. Oh, would it be Disney? It would be, Dan. And Disney um, plays an important factor here. And by the way, 
the star, one of the co-stars, actually he was nominated, he was nominated for an Oscar in this movie for supporting um, male actor was Johnny Depp, who is a controversial figure. You know, he's been accused of domestic violence. He's been arrested, all these sort of things. But Disney decided to invest in him here. They've stood by Johnny Depp. Dan is, is flashing the money sign here. And I think that's a very important theme in the beginning parts of this book. But we'll get to that in just a second. But first, let's get to the general vibes for the second half of Violent J's memoir. Um, Julia, what, what is your general feelings about the, the, the second half of Violent J's book? Well, I completely enjoyed it because, um, you know, just being a fan, you get to listen to the music, maybe see them live, but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And the second half was more about behind the scenes stuff. I enjoyed it. Dan? So there, I didn't enjoy this half of the book as much as the first half of the book. I guess I'm Sometimes I'm a sucker for the, the kind of the, the I'm, I'm a sucker for the fall part of the story than the rise and the fall of the story. But obviously, like he wrote this when he was 31. So he did talk about some downtimes he had, certainly towards the end of the book. But I guess I was actually more happy with the rise of ICP and kind of VJ's uh, formative years. But there's definitely some cool parts of this book. There's definitely some cool parts of the second half of the book. I definitely laughed out loud, I think, more than I did because of the weird shenanigans he got up to in his 20s. What do you got, Brian? I um, you know, very similar to the first half of the book. I loved it. Um, I I'm trying. You know, my feelings are kind of blend together, and that always happens when you're going over a book. You know, like it's 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 hard to divide it strictly by halves. But still, um, I found um, the sort of the attitude, the idea of Violent J, you know, going through depression and kind of redeeming himself through exercise or kind of the introspective elements to be very interesting as a pro wrestling person, especially the history of pro wrestling. I mean, he, he talks a little bit about it beforehand, but here we go deeper into his ta their time with uh, the WWF, WWE. I found that to be um, fascinating. Um, and so I liked it a lot. And I, I, again, I don't want to repeat too much last time, especially since the last time I was just so tired. I just kept saying it way too many times. But like the fastidiousness of just going through each of the details and the sort of introspection of it, you know, them deciding to play the Woodstock Festival, I found to be a very fascinating episode. So many different things. And just the sort of dedication to wanting to do their autograph tours right and um yeah stuff like that I, I i really um i really enjoy it cool cool so what would you say are kind of the pros of the book then the pros of this half of the book then because we got pros we got cons i feel like you at least got something to say certainly about the pros what do you got um i felt you know similar to the first half dealing with depression um you know, him talking about freaking out on the bus, him talking about, you know, mental health issues I find to be important, something I definitely identify with. I found, you know, they start, like, we, we, we're joining um, in Chapter 14, so we're right at the, the crux of the record label side of the issues, you know. And I found that to be fascinating and that how he, you know, they kind of regretted some things that they did um, with Hollywood records, but they don't, he really looks at it on the face of it, you know, like he really, they were able to navigate it successfully. And I found that interesting. And I thought the, um, yeah, like I really enjoyed that. They're, they're like, even like I, what I like is the dead ends. And that's a funny thing to say, but like they unsuccessful, it, they were unsuccessful into breaking into Europe basically you know and i thought it was interesting to for them to still go through the journey and to say hey look we didn't succeed but it's so cool my brother got to be in england for 13 months and you know what 
We tried, but that's it. You know? Fair enough. What, about what do you, you got, Julia? Julia? What you were your favorite, heard? like, pros, pros that, uh, the pros of the pros? Um, what were some of your favorite moments? How about, like, specific favorite moments that you thought were really awesome? When they went to Australia. So elaborate on that because not everyone's read the book. What's the cool part of when they went to Australia? Just like how they were completely welcomed and every, like, it seemed like everybody loved them, even though they had no idea. <laughs> no, that is very cool. And it's something that it, to build on what you said is I, I, we talked about this a little bit last episode is I find insane clown posse to be kind of a uniquely, or we did at least without a uniquely American phenomenon. It's kind of like, there, there, there's people of different social classes and education upbringings across the world, but the way that they manifest it with their kind of mix of, you know, kind of American carnival style stuff, which is unique in its own sense, but um, that and the kind of mishmash of hip hop and rock, I mean, it's a uniquely American phenomenon and it's really cool that, but and the first thing I would have thought is, okay, this will go over in England just fine. Like they're going to get over there and England, they have, I mean, they kind of people derog in, with derogatory terms talk about chavs. So people who are kind of like low class hip hop, you know, projects kind of people and that you don't really see as much of that layover, but you see, like you said, you go to another country and like, oh, cool. They, they got a follow in there. There's people that are open up and, and opening up and totally like, you know what? We're cool. So I get that. I appreciate but, that. But I mean, like that, that, it's a very American thing just to think of British people as Dick Van Dyke and, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, with his, with his crazy accent, but like, you know, there's hooligans in England, like London's a rough city too and like in australia you have bogans right which is like um it, it's a term that sometimes derogatory it's, it, it's the equivalent of like redneck i guess in australian culture it's trailer parks you know yeah. so i america tends to highlight that aspect of their side too but it shouldn't be that surprising you know i i i regret a bit saying trash culture like i did in the first half of the book I don't, because I can say that, and I don't necessarily mean it in a derogatory sense, but when you listen, look at the words trash <laughs> in culture, you de it definitely is derogatory. You know, I, I, so I want to be more aware of that. But you, when you're talking about lower economic status, lower middle up economic status, cultural things, like those things do exist in Australia, and those things do exist in England and elsewhere. So it shouldn't be that surprising in that sense, you know, and even just like, for example, you know, um, you know, run DMC talks about Adidas and track suits or other things that are very, very specific. That's what I mean to say here. De La Soul will get into very specific cultural things. And to me, it's almost exotic in a sense. And I think it's exotic when other people look at them, too. So I don't think that even if Fago isn't there, people can still identify it with it. You know what I'm saying? Like I listened to the streets a lot in late high school and college, which is British grime, hip hop stuff. And he talked about put on our classics and let's put on a little uh, put on our classics and we'll have a little dance, shall we? And I didn't even realize that Reebok classics were a brand of shoe, you know, but I just but that's all good. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can still really identify with it. Right on. Yeah, there's scrubs from around the world. And that's the term that he tends to use, which is kind of his own, like, we're the scrubs. Uh, well, not the Bruce Brothers with, were scrubs, right? The Bruce Brothers were scrubs. Yeah. And he said, but this is music for the scrubs. And, you know, that's definitely half of, you know, we talk about outcast cultures for sure. And that's, that's you know, he, they're not calling themselves trash. They're calling themselves scrubs, which I can relate to at times. I've definitely been the frumpy dude in high school who wore baggy jeans and wasn't one of the cool kids. So, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you just misspoke there. You said you were, you were the frumpy dude. I, I was. No, he says no. I know. I'm, I'm basically Fabio now, as you can tell by my sweet long hair and my ads and, uh, you know, my ads and I can't believe it's not butter commercials, but you know, not everybody is born beautiful. Like, like we are, Brian. So to that end, yeah. what were some of the other pros that you found from the pros of the second half of the book? Then, Brian? I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed again, like, um, I enjoyed the anecdotes extremely much about, um, 
you know, it's repeating some themes. You know, history's rhyming here, especially since we're talking about hip hop. You know, when they wanted to break in, they got Esham and Kid Rock. When they wanted to get to the next level, they get Snoop Dogg and Old Dirty Bastard. And disappointingly, George Clinton as well, but they didn't even use his stuff, which I, again, that's so punk rock to me. I love George Clinton. I would love to hear George Clinton with ICP, but ICP is so punk rock to me because they're willing to say, you know, George Clinton is a genius and he is overall in the grand scheme of musical history of great importance, but they're more interested in creating their own scale of importance. And to them, having Esham is probably more critical than having George Clinton. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. And actually going back to one of the first things I was going to mention on this and I thought was good is that I did, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're totally unaware of who these people are outside of their circle sometimes. And simultaneously, they said that they're talking to kids that are, in the last chapter, they talked about how there's, you know, all these groups that they grew up with that they thought were just canonical, important people. And then these are people that are their fans, the Juggalos, you know, and they're like, we're talking about ghetto boys and all this stuff. And these people may not have any idea what that is. And so it, it speaks to the kind of, you know, different cultures that exist out there for sure. But the fact there is something kind of funny about the fact that they're like, even though ODB gave us, basically he just sat there and blithered, you know, just dropping the B word over and over again on tape for about two minutes. They're like, all right, we're going to cut this up. We're going to make eight lyrics and we're going to make, cause we need to have him on there. And I was like, part of me was just like, I mean, I guess that's, I mean, you just want the credit of having ODB, you know, on the, you know, kind of pinnacle, mm -hmm. slightly post pinnacle era of ODB, but this is definitely in the like crack smoking, barely, you know, not, not drooling on himself days of ODB. So, but I'm like, hey, whatever, you got them on their album. But yeah, it is kind of funny. They're like, not nah, George Clinton, no thanks. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I mean, I, they don't really get into it here, but like they got Steve Jones on the album. And to me, Steve Jones, you know, never mind the Bullocks, one of the great guitar performances on the albums. But Violent J elsewhere has talked about how he didn't really know um, the Sex Pistols. He yeah. didn't, and... And Steve Jones, you know, was paid a, a chunk of money to put a bunch of guitar tracks on. Um, what song is that? It's on um, the Great Malenko. He, he, but so Steve Jones, you know, did a bunch of overdubs, and so Violent Jays talked about how they stripped all the guitar tracks except for one, buried it in the mix, <laughs> and then that that was that. Like, you know, like they, like they're not. Hmm, how, how can we say this? Obviously, just from the first half of the book, he, he cares a lot about local hip-hop, Detroit hip-hop history. But he's not like a rock guy, other than Pearl Jam, you know, and, and yeah. Slash. But Slash is almost, you know, transcends rock yeah. into pop. And Slash played with Michael Jackson, you know, so. So there you go. That was, I think that was one of the things he's like, dude, play with Michael Jackson. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you can't yeah. you can't like for the fact that he probably you know Appetite for Destruction is probably one of the ten best selling albums in the world ever. He played with Michael Jackson, who was the number one best selling album of all time, <laughs> and unassailable to him. Yeah. He makes Billy. He does make. He mentions I'm walking along like you know lit up tiles like in the Billy Jean video. So clearly, you see he does have some of these cultural touchstones that we all have. But yeah, it's very odd. It's like I don't know anything about the Sex Pistols. I hadn't heard of them. I'm like okay. Yeah, I, I don't think he really cares about George Clinton. I don't think. I mean. P-Funk has played The Gathering, but, you know, as they kind of make clear, The Gathering wasn't necessarily their idea, and they don't really book it, but obviously their influence is there. Yeah, yeah, So another, but going back to another pro that I thought you pulled up is that their take on, I mean, every one of these stories, I mean, every person who's, you know, a performer of something, everybody, everybody out there, it goes through ups and downs, depression, anxiety, et cetera. Everybody goes through those things, but his take on it, his take on how he responds to fame was a little bit different than most people. He had interesting takes on it. And I think, um, like you said, he, he addresses the fact that in his late twenties, towards the end of the, I mean, he wrote this book or at least put it out when he was 31. So, you know, this is exactly like they're riding high. They just, they were still in the process of recording uh, the second half of the the Joker, the six Jokers card. So they were still kind of like riding high on their um, kind of not popularity because that's clearly what they said, but they're kind of uh, cultural zeitgeist where they were in the cultural zeitgeist. They put out this book in 2003 and were probably, 
you know, it was, it was written and committed to paper right before that. But anyways, they're dealing with fame. And instead of the typical, like, I went up, I started having panic attacks, I had some depression, and I got sober. It was just like, you know what? I'm on Vicodin, I'm on Xanax. I discovered weed. And now yeah. that is the cure for everything. And it's not one of those. And, and another one that I thought was very funny is, uh, I think it was actually one of the kind of like, I think it was chapter 17 or so. He was just like, I stopped doing anything I considered a sin. It, there was, that was sort of the cruel humor of it. I'm in the middle of this Fago lubed Sodom and Gomorrah. And I suddenly realized I have to get all spiritual. And so it's just funny. He's just like, I had this epiphany where I need to like clean up my act. And it's like, but cleaning up his act still involves having lots of sex and cleaning up his act involves, I'm going to smoke tons of weed. <laughs> and so I thought that was kind of funny. It's not like get clean and get, you know, that, so, but I mean, whatever, he's 31 when he wrote this. So what, what's your take on that? I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, he's, he doesn't clean anything up, you know? So he, he, there's just a sincerity to it. I just believe the things um, that he says. And there, it's because he, he, he clearly had less um, societal guidance and adult supervision and stuff. I don't know if he's just not completely aware of it all the time or he just doesn't give a fuck. And either way, I'm kind of fine with it, you know? Cool, cool, cool. Fair enough. What do you got on that? Do you have any, any insight on that, on the, the, their take on fame? Uh, schizotic? I mean, it seems normal to me. Yeah. <laughs> what happened when you went to one of ICP's um, uh, autograph events? Oh, man. I totally panicked and blanked out <laughs> because they were in front of me. And even though I've seen them in front of me before at shows, yes. But, like, it wasn't at a show. They were just there. I'm pretty sure I panicked. I was probably crying. Just blacked uh, out. Totally uh, relatable like, content. <laughs> here, 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 here's some, here's some, um, some quotes I pulled out, right? Bring it. Tell me what you think about this, Dan. When we started out, people might not have thought we had a ton, uh, ton of talent or smarts, but we had vision. From the beginning, we laid the vision we made the vision a reality. So sure, you give Eminem a producer like Dr. Dre a million dollar videos at MTV, and he can have, um, he can have, he can have it. We never had no Dre. We had to put ourselves on. Nobody once ever gave us a lift. We walked all the way to get where we are. What do you think about that, Dan? No, that was interesting. And it's funny as they did. Um... They, they, like you said, it's like they're, they, at that point in their book, they were kind of mad at Kid Rock and Eminem for dissing them. That was what they were talking about is obviously they never, they, they talk interestingly about the fact that they're like, all right, Kid Rock's an all right guy now. I think, I think they were okay with Kid Rock at this point. They said, they're like, we don't like his music. He did diss us. That sucked. Obviously they have a lot of beef with Eminem, which of course became bigger right around the time that this book, but they, they didn't actually address it huge amounts other than the fact that like, they just kind of said like, Eminem is just getting on a record and talking, talking trash to us. But they do make a big point over and over again that um, um, they make a big point that they did it on their own. And I think for the most part, that's true. It's, it's, and I do appreciate about that. And going back to Julia's point is that they make a point of really connecting with the fans only, only up to a point. Like obviously there's, okay. So they, they make a point. They make, they talk as they probably talk more about their interactions and trying to make their, uh, like their, their, their interactions with the fans in terms of like autograph sets, things like that, where they're interacting with fans more than they do the recording of the albums, which they, they, they're like, we're not going to get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. They don't talk much about the recording of almost any single track, which That's a very in good some point. ways, and, and that they really talk about how for them, it's not like, it's not stargazing as much. They're not sitting there saying like, oh man, you know, they did have a little bit of that with Slash and with Leaf Garrett of all people. But for the most part, they're not stargazing. They're, they talk very little about that. They talk, we're with the fans, and that's what matters to us. And, uh, yeah, and that's what's important to them. But up to a point, though. Go ahead. I mean, it's like the first half of the book where, you know, they, they basically say, you know, you, know, you know, Kanye West, for example, is very famous for 
spending hours and hours and hours and choosing a snare sample to use in a song. And they talked about in the first half of the book about how they kind of got, they felt they got suckered into doing that a bit when they started their music. They're, I, you know, like they're not, they're more invested in the overall plan than the details. You know what I'm saying? No, that, and that's absolutely important to them. And that, he mentions that in the last yeah. half of the book. He's like, even if everything after we do these Joker cards sucks, we had the big idea and we put it down. And so that's kind of cool. I mean, like yeah. you said, I think I, I, there's actually something to refer. It, it's punk rock, as you like to say, is ICP is one of the last punk groups out there. Is they're like, you know what? We just got to get this down. And you listen to the first, the first album, certainly with Carnival of Carnage, the tracks that they were most excited about were the simplest tracks. The ones where we're just like, we're just going to drop a beat and do our rap over it. It's actually the ones that they were like, we spent way too much money making uh, Redneck Ho <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that, where actually it's easily their most well-produced and put together song, but it's not the one that they're like most proud of or your rebel flag too. Those are the, those are the other ones they did. And they're not like super proud of that. They're super proud of like, we just got this idea down and it's bigger picture rather than my new detail stuff, which I think is really cool about them. Yeah, the three, and, their version um, of three chords and the truth. Well, speaking of three chords of the truth, as you would with country music, um, like a lot of um, underground country acts, um, you know, they have a lot of trouble with record labels, and they detail that a lot here. Um, when they're talking about dealing with Island Records, um, one line that he says is, "All record labels fucking suck dick ass, dick." At and ask somehow. So, Dan, can you play a, a song that I sent you there? What you got that? Why did you bring the uh, R.A. the Rugged Man into this? Well, that, that, that was from R.A. the Rugged Man's first project, which was an aborted project called Crucify Dibs. When they say, all record labels fucking suck dick, I thought about that for sure. I think that when he wrote that in the book, it might have been specifically a reference to that. There's a very famous story where R.A. the Rugged Man was in a project called Crucify Dibs, and they released the single, which he got the record label Jive to put out. But um, and then he had a mental breakdown and they never released the album until many years later. Some more of it was released. But anyway, I think um, it's a big theme about it. Like they they care more about what's going on in the label than the labels do. They care more about what's going on than the other business people, including the great um, breakdown of their interactions with Sharon Osbourne. Yeah. Which is a definitely a highlight as well, which is something that I was familiar with. But what were you, you going to say, Dan? I was going to say that is one of the highlights of the book where they, I mean, we call kind of, it's one of the big things that happened to them. So for those of you who haven't watched is, or aren't, aren't familiar with the saga of this is that ICP took a band that Sarah or that, that uh, Sharon Osbourne was managing out on the road, Cold Chamber, and they just all didn't get along together. It's like when you throw like this goth, you know, pop metal band on the road with ICP, Industry. They're, yeah, industrial, yeah, got like an industrial kind of pop kind of thing going. It's just not going to, I mean, they, they, they've made a point of that throughout the book. I, juggalos are fickle with the stuff that they want. Just like, you know, whatever, every band that, uh, every band that the Who, you know, had open for them got booed as well. You know, this is a thing that's common throughout musical things. And ICP just didn't get along with them. They felt like they were being put on. So IT, ICP goes on Howard Stern and they trash Cold Chamber and they trash Sharon Osbourne. So Sharon Osbourne's like, no, I'm going to represent this. And so she gets on and they have like a 40, 40 minute long episode of the radio show where ICP and Sharon Osbourne just call each other just foul stuff the whole time. And that was probably, like you said, one of the kind of them at the height of their zeitgeist. Yeah, yeah, like it's something that I had seen before because the, on the Howard Stern TV show that's been there, and I'd seen that online before as well. And so, yeah, like um, they they pulled Cold Chamber off the tour, and that really upset Sharon Osbourne. And then they went on the um, 
they were on Howard Stern together and, and they, you know, they battled each other back and forth. And although Sharon Osbourne very famously made a bet with them that their next albums, which at the time were bizarre and bizarre, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't sell. I, was it 500,000 copies? I'm asking Julia here. I don't, I don't remember the exact amount, but they, they, they made a bet about how many would sell. And Sharon took to the low, obviously. And ICP did do it. And Sharon was supposed to donate money to a charity. She never has. However, it's, it's, Sharon Osborne's known for just being a big bitch. So. Well, and it's funny, it's just to that end, is if you go look up, you can find, if you go look up ICP versus Sharon Osborne, it's right on YouTube. And you can actually watch, or at least you can hear the audio from it. Obviously, you can't watch the video of it, but you can watch the audio from it. And it says, from August 20th, 1999 episode of the Howard Stern Radio Show. Fat Fat B still owes ICP $50,000, which pretty much comes straight out of the book. Is that they, after, you know, ICP talks it up and then mentions after Bizarre, Bizarre, you know, the, they, 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 the guys were interested and straightforward about the fact they're like, we, you know, we were scared. We didn't do the six Joker card right away. So we did a double album, Bizarre and Bizarre, two spelled differently. And they only debuted at 20 and 21 on the Billboard charts, which so that was disappointing after, I believe, Great Malenko was like number four in the Heat Seekers. Like it debuted really high. And they mentioned like, hey, it's still, they still sold 300,000 copies a piece. But yeah, and then they said that fat beast still owes us money. So you know what? They, they, they're, they're, not, they're not star lovers. They're not star effers as, uh, as the Rolling Stones song goes. No, but that show was hilarious and also bizarre and bizarre. Amazing. That's one we're Speaking about that album, well, I'm going to get back to that album. We're going to get to the negatives in a second here. But I just want to mention one more quote that I um, really like as well because it it's a, plays off a theme in the first half. Um, and it was something that I've been saying around town, and then I read it here, and I was like, I very much identify with it. Here's a quote from Mr. Violent J. By the way, if he ever got his doctorate, and which you might identify with, would he be Dr. J? Obvi. <laughs> oh, Here you go. What do you mean, Dr. Joe Bruce Lee? <laughs> Listen, my wise man advice to you all. Your job should never suck. After all, it's what we do for a living. If you do something that sucks for a living, you suck for a living. Then here's what you should do. Quit right now. What do you think about that, Julia? Um, you've told me this multiple times. I think that's really good. I think I, I find that very inspiring. Like I said last time, and I say again, much more inspiring than, you know, a poster in a corporate office of a, you know, a cat rolling some yarn and shit. Um, See, we good. You want to talk about some of the negatives now? No, no. no. So, but to that end, I got a couple of quotes and I highlighted this, the, the, the part after that and don't necessarily think that that's a great thing. I think it's a, it, it, it is, if you're, it's good, it's a good mindset if you're, when you're 31. For sure. And if you're an entertainer, you're just like, no, I'm not going to settle for this. But here's the part that comes after that is that we only get 80 some years of life on this planet. So fuck wasting your time here on earth doing something that fucking sucks every day. I don't care if you got kids, they're just going to have to starve for a little minute because if you get trapped doing something that sucks, it's going to suck every day. I don't know if I agree with that mindset. It's like, you know, I, I, I understand, but obviously I'm the one who's going through a PhD program right now and had to sit through a statistics class just a minute ago. So, you know, there's pain to be, there's pain to get to the, the end point, but the end point is what, you know, what you decide is, you know, there's, they, they talk about how much it sucked being in Kinko's every day. Their end goal was the end goal that they had, you know, if your job is just, so there's people who work for a living and there's people who live for their work, you know? And some people are just like, you know what? This is my hobby outside of work. I just flip burgers all day. That's cool. That's what I do. But to that end, we wouldn't have, but, but to your point, we wouldn't have ICP if they didn't, you know, commit to this. And so I get, I, I get that mindset, but maybe it's not for everybody. You know what? Especially I don't love the fact that he's like, if you got, I don't care if you got kids, they're just going to have to starve for a minute. I'm like, mm, not well, feeling that. Move let, 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 here, here's the thing. Two things I got to say. Number one, I think the term that would, um, kind of put this uh, in a more clear way to quote the police in one of their early singles is dead end job. Doing an aspect of your job that requires work or effort that kind of sucks, but isn't, doesn't uh, finish in a dead end that you're doing for a purpose. For example, you, you know, crawling through shit or whatever you do, that's fine because you know you're going to a place here, but if there's a dead end to it, who cares? And, you know, I, 
you know, you're, I, I, I know you personally, I know your family and I know your dad, you know, he, he had some very unconventional things, but I think you had a good relationship with your, your father, right? He always loved you, right? It seemed like you guys got along well and there were sacrifices to be made, but wasn't that more important than if your dad was miserable with a shitty job? Yeah, he had to pay the bills for the first 18 years of my life. So he had that. It made me happy and made me sane. And we got to do a lot of cool stuff together. So, but like you said, it was after I turned 18 that my dad was just like, you know what? F this. I'm done having the dead end job. I'm going to fight for like the rights of people who are oppressed until I die. And that's what he did until he died. And so I was like, right on. That's cool. But I guess he kind of said, you know what? I got I to gotta get the kids fed. I'm going to put the, off my dreams, delay the dreams a little bit, have the dead end job. And he got through. So, I mean, I see it both ways. I totally understand. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have rap stars. We wouldn't have geniuses out there if they didn't put that mindset into place that we were just talking about in the book. But on the other hand, we wouldn't have grocery shop workers. You know, we just have a lot, a lot of crappy rappers out there. We'd have a lot of SoundCloud rap out there if people dedicated to their, their lives to that. But you know what? It's, a, it's the trade-off, right? It's like you got to have people who just live to work and there's got to be people that work to live. Well, but yeah, well, some people are just, they're just fine. They're just settling in. They have other priorities. They have their hobbies. They have other things that they're dealing with. And they'll just, you know, like, um, they'll settle into where they're comfortable. And that's fine. Like, you just, as, if, as long as they don't have a shame in the game, do it, you know? True that, true that. All right, let's get to some negatives. We got to move on, all right? All right. Um, I really didn't like how... The he's, he, 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 there's a one part where he's very much obfuscating. Do you know what I'm talking about? Please. The breakdown of the relationship with Mikey Clark. Okay. Expand upon that. You know so expand upon that. So expand upon that. Maybe uh, expand upon that for the fans. For our sure. fan who's not so, in the room with you. <laughs> so they were... Um, uh, as as Violent J sort of profiles um, that um, they started having issues with Mikey Clark, who produced all their music up to that point, or most of it, almost all, right? Um, and on the first album, um, there's a couple of tracks even, but anyway, and um, so they were making a supergroup album called The Dark Lotus, and so here's um, uh, a quote um, from it. Can you hear me? You can hear me okay, Dan? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm about to tell you something real, something many of you all most likely will not understand. I don't like the Dark Lotus album. I don't listen to it, and I hated the tour. It was a time of personal hell for me. The album for me is too morbid, dark, and slow. I love the rap and music, but it just puts me into a mood I don't like. Um, there are tracks of the Wicked Chip where we always show the other side as well. Lotus is grim because to me it's tarnished by Mars. And the fallout with Mikey Clark, the pen attacks, and many other things for me. So there he mentions Mikey Clark and mentions other things as well. But um, he, he, he goes on to talk a little bit more about the issues with Mikey Clark. Um, this is what he says. He says... Um, On Mikey Clark and us, so they started making the album Bizarre, Bizarre, Bizarre. They're making the double albums, and they did not. They decided to part ways during the making of that album, the double album or two album, double album or two albums, two albums. And this is all he says there. He says, "On Mikey Clark and us parting ways, I say this: to make a long story short, we just couldn't meet eye to eye on business, and even I guess a personal level anymore." And it was in the best interest for us and him to go our separate ways. Flat out, we fell out. I've, with everything being so insightful and deep and personal and cutting in such a realistic way, I find that to be very much lacking. You know what I'm saying? Fair enough, fair enough. What, what's your take on this? Because I know we got, we got a juggalo in the room. What's your feeling about how or what, what has happened since then also? Do you know anything about that? Uh it just keeps on falling and then coming back. <laughs> I don't think that it'll ever like totally disappear. He always comes back. Mikey Clark is always going to be there. 
I mean, and that's a good he's point. He's currently too. producing their stuff, or most of their stuff, or a lot of their say, stuff. He's been on and off. He has. If you go look at his discography on uh, Wikipedia, you can see right away. Like, so this book came out in 2003 during their hiatus from each other. But then he comes back in 2005. He does Forgotten Freshness Volume Four. He does many other. He ends up coming back with them and doing a lot of psycho. You know, a lot of stuff for Psychopathic Records. He does Boondocks. He did Kid Rock. He uh, produced an album of theirs. He did Shaggy t- uh, Two Dope's first solo album, F, you know, FTFO, F the F off. And then he comes back and he starts doing the Wraith remix albums. He did two albums for them in 2007. Like he comes back. He comes back into their life. So it's good to see that. It's, it's good to see that. Uh, On Mighty Death Pod, he had, an old, had a whole album dedicated to, you know, a mixtape he put together, right? Exactly. Yeah, Julia says yes. Yep, yep, yep. So that's cool. I mean, it's one of those where I think it's good because they didn't just come out. But it, the one thing I will say this, and it comes back to the book a little bit, is that they do a good job not holding grudges with the people they love. They don't burn down too many bridges. They pretty much are like, you know what? And it's not out of them being PC. There's definitely people that are like, you know, F this guy. I don't like it. But they said like, Esham. They're like, you know, we had a big ass fight. Esham. With him. Esham. Sorry. Esham. They had a big ass fight with him and hashed it out. And now they're cool. And now Esham, you know, toured with them on the, uh, the tour, when they were doing the support for the Bizarre albums. And now he's on the late, you know, he was on the label for a period of time. And so, and it was the same with Mikey Clark. They're like, listen, we don't want to talk this too much crap. We love him. We just start, you know, stop jiving with each other. And I appreciate that about them. That's, that's some integrity is that they don't just, they don't just do the, you know, just shit on everybody along the way. They're like, these guys did stuff good for well, us. And we appreciate it. Ex- except, except for Radiohead. Well, uh, obviously, the radio had nothing to do with their, their but they, 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 they beat the crap out of them. Definitely a highlight of the first half of the book, for sure. <laughs> couldn't disagree, couldn't, can't disagree with that. And, like, they show love for the Foo Fighters who played a show with them and, and, and uh, encouraged their fans to stay. You know, like, they, they call people out. But with, like, um, Mikey Clark and Ishan, those are two guys that were around before them, and they just show deference to them to some degree. You know, like yeah, I yeah. mentioned last time, after this book came out, Isham and them got into another beef, and now they're back together again. So, mm-hmm. so what are your cons from this book? I want to I want to hear from uh, Schizotic here. What do you got? What are you feeling? Is there anything that you weren't digging about uh, this book? I did not like the description of the panic attacks, only because every time I read it, I slightly go into a panic attack. No, that's a very good point. Is that he does a very he had his first like major panic attack on the bus and he thought he was going to die and he was freaking out and it was graphic. I agree with you is that that's um I mean graphic is their thing that they do but he paints a picture of it that's really horrifying. Obviously he doesn't die or anything or have any like get, but he had to he got he got, well in Florida we call it being baker acted. He got committed for a couple of days and that was a down time for him. So yeah, you got a good point there. Is that was that was an intense part of the book for sure. I also understand uh, his dislike for Dark Lotus. I love it, but I also have a tendency to like darker things. This is a very dark album. There is no positivity at all. Fair enough. That's the thing. And I think you got it right. Not you got something it right. you want to listen to if you are in a uh, depressed state, we will say. Fair enough. Fair enough. I saw it from a group to a song called "Blood uh, Guts on the Ceiling." Yeah, true story. So fair enough. No, you got a good point there. So you got to be in the right mood for it. But um, I still haven't listened to it yet, so full disclosure. But the way he describes it, he's like, "It was a downer, man." And that's the thing that ICP does well is they do levity. They do this is evil stuff. This is good stuff. This is stuff we laugh at. Like they 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 have a good sense of humor. When you cut out that sense of humor, it gets kind of dark. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. What about you, Dan? What did you have something that you found negative? I mean, we talked a little bit about this. Is that um, I mean, their homophobia not cool? The fact that they like to use groupies that, but at least he kind of cleaned up his point. He's like, you know what? I'm done with these people who are using me. He kind of talks about that all earlier in the book. He's like, I he 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 would just have he would just use groupies, and at that point, he realized that was part of this whole like, nah, I gotta stop sending thing. I gotta just like, at least he knows he's just having one night stands with these people, and he actually talks at least in this part of the book about like, you know, I found out that somebody I had a one night stand with overdosed. And had a, you know, and he's like, I feel so bad for it. I'm like, okay, that's cool. It still doesn't atone for the fact that he really doesn't have the best relationship with uh, how, you know, what he does with the women in his book. But whatever, he's 31. The other one, though, is he definitely fat shames somebody in the book. And I wasn't cool about that. 
there's definitely one time in a show where he was just what? like, but he, he, he fat shames himself. He fat shames himself, but that doesn't give you license to say like, look at this bitch over here. God damn. Does she really think she's sexy? What? She looks like a fucking sea otter in a wig. Like, and he was just freaking out about what, I mean, and in some ways it's like, okay, you can, you can laugh at it. He, 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 he very graphically describes and you can picture it, but it's just like, bro, at that time you were pushing 300, man. <laughs> So I, I was, wasn't feeling that. But uh, here's another point, but more to the point of something that you would have, uh, you talk about not necessarily obfuscating, but talking about differences in his perception of what is selling out and what is not selling out. You know, there's compromises versus not compromises. And they talk about this pretty regularly in the book that they're, they never sold. They say they, we didn't sell out. You know, like we got famous without TRL. They tried to get on TRL and didn't get their video pre-approved for the like being able to be on TRL process. So they kind of waffle a little bit on like, they talk about like, we did this all our own, we're all underground, but they tried to get on TRL. They were on Disney and they compromised some of the lyrics to get Great Malenko released. They took out some of the gang related violence and they removed three tracks. I'm not saying that. They regret that. that. They, they, they did. He, he and, admits and, that that was a mistake. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's one of those where it's like, Okay, fair enough. I'll give you that. And so, but they to that also end, I, released the three tracks. They did end up releasing after. that on Forgotten Freshness, I believe, one of the Forgotten Freshnesses. So, uh, I wasn't feeling that, but for the most part, I was just like, "All right, cool, I get it." But other times, they're like, "You know what? No, we're not compromising." And I appreciate that that they're not compromising their vision. But there are some moments where they're trying to kind of back up and justify it a little. I, so, I think there's one moment, but like remember, so they signed with Hollywood Records with the explicit agreement that, that Disney wouldn't fuck with their stuff, and they mentioned Miramax and such, and then they, they kind of waffled a bit on that. They figured, okay, we'll play ball, then they, but they admit that and they regret it. TRL, I see as something different. They were trying to punk the system. They were, they were, they were trying to sabotage it, basically, which I think is fine, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, don't, I, don't, I find that to be very different. It wasn't like they changed their music to get on TRL. They, they, they made like a project out of being on there for one day. I find, I'm okay. fine with that. All right, fair enough. I think another con to this is the whole, they had this long story about fuck the Beastie Boys, basically saying at least Violent J, he admits this, he's, he's, an, he's an asshole, but he doesn't like the Beastie Boys talking about like they're at that pay, at that stage of their career they were big on the whole like we got to talk like talking on stage about like we got to talk about Tibet we got to talk about Tibet and free Tibet and Violent J was like fuck that noise and you and I have talked about this a little bit though is that to the end where it's very easy to talk about safe topics and to pat yourself on the back for being um, for for standing up for for things that are easy to stand up with that are relatively unobjectionable. But I still, and, and, and to some extent, BC boys are kind of doing that, but they brought something to the mainstream that most people didn't know about. Is it something most people can do anything about? Not really. And it's, so it's kind of a safe cause. It's literally on the other side of the world. I didn't love the fact that they were trash talking BC boys for, 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 for using their, um, their platform to talk about some jo social justice issues. Any thoughts on that? Well, and, and, well I, think, I think ICP did soften up on that later on i think that's part of the aging thing and i think with the beastie boys is also just part of their spiritual side you know they became really buddhist mm -hmm. really influenced from that side as well i don't think i should be really they didn't seem to if they didn't if they identified it um they didn't put too much value in that at least at the time later on that would come out with icp exactly um and um with uh, and I, but I think there's a, a strong point, you know, like ICP was talking about local issues that affected their local communities. And, but you know, the beastie boys were Manhattan rich kids anyway, you know? So they, point. they took kind of a safer route in, in that sense, you can make up argument that they did highlight something internationally, but they really could have done some more of the local stuff. Anyway, that's enough with that sort of thing. Dan, why don't you, um, play that next, uh, our next section clown college what did we learn today clown college what did we learn today julia what do you got for us what did you learn about icp in general and in the big picture that you felt was uh particularly particularly important to you 
What was the weird, surprising thing that you got? How about that? Uh, I'll, I'll take. I'll let her think about it for a second. I'll, I'll take on, take on it for now. Yeah, like I, I mean, to me, it's a continuation of of a lot of things in the first half. I really think you understand, like you start to see the maturing here of them. That's a. It, I know that's an easy thing to laugh at, but you start to see the sort of them settling into becoming adults. You see Violent J starting to move into being an adult here in the second half. And I think it really shows the evolution. You know, like last time we talked with Sarah, who was really upset about some of the things in the first half and whether they realized or evolved. The second half shows evolution. And it shows that I think the ball starts rolling for where they're going to be to where they are today. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you to did? that end, that's kind of building on what I said, is that they ended the book on a very positive note. He talked about how he had some major panic attack issues, but then he comes back and he's really kind of, um, he spends the last chapter of the book being really wistful. He's like, I'm going for walks. I spent most of my time thinking about time. So many of the Hicks who would come see me at various cities every time I came to town no longer came out to see me. They just moved on. They grew out of that. It's all new chicks now. But I think, the old, I think about the old ones and I hope they're okay. So I think that that's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. They were, they had, uh, he comes back and he comes back in a pretty positive note. And I thought that that was pretty cool. Other kind of wise words, as I think it were, I see, um, he says, you know what, it, but, but to that end, it's like, that, like you said, they're growing up, but he's also admitting, it's like, you know, don't have too many regrets about things. He's like, it's okay to be young, crazy, horny, freaky, crazy, and all that in my book. Life's too short. To not to experience it when you all can. Be safe and all, yeah, but fuck. When you're not in love, married with kids, why not live it up for some days and get your stories together? You're going to need them stories to recall for the rest of your life. Them stories are the future smiles on your face while you're washing dishes for a family of seven. So going back to what you're talking about is that he says, uh, you know, you got to sacrifice some things, but you know, you got to sacrifice some things, but you got to, uh, you know what, live it up now before you're going to, you're settling down before you crack a vertebra and break your wrist on stage uh, as he did in uh, that. No, but he's pretty much just saying, it's like, you know what, live for the moment. And I thought that was a good, that was a good take home point is that he's, you know, considering their um, kind of, like you said, he had some down times and it's kind of weird how he came around to fixing himself. But uh, yeah, he was just like, you know what, you know, them, the, them stories are the future smiles on your face for while you're washing dishes for your family of seven. And that's where he's at now. I don't know. He obviously couldn't prognosticate. That was before he had kids, you know? And so he doesn't talk about his kids or his partner or anything like that. But, you know, it's kind of cool. But he's still living the dream. So whatever. We can't really say too much. We can't, we, we can't, we can't fault him for that. He's still living the dream. And he's having his cake and eating it too, which is kind of cool. Anything yeah. you want to add to that, Julia? I mean, for the book as a whole, I learned more about, you know, the childhood stuff that he had to go through was uh, not too far away from what I kind of had to go to as well. So I, it kind of connected me more. But um, the other stuff, I don't know, I've, I've been uh, keeping on their tabs four years so and also read this book many a times the only thing that I really learned was from the first half of the book right on right on and those are the more formative years and for me that was the stronger half of the book so I'll give you that it's like that for me that was the stronger half of the book that was the part where he had to overcome a lot and they had they hustled they hustled but you know what that's the cool part of the second half of the book he's like you know what I hustled, I got where I'm at, I'm gonna enjoy it for some time, you know? I'm gonna try not to be a dick, I'm gonna try to grow up a little bit, not hate, you know, not just use women, you know, enjoy life, but uh, do some crazy shit while I'm at it. Okay. Put it this way, if he continued this book with the same co-writer in the same style up to current day, I'd be all over it. Exactly, definitely, definitely for sure. All right, well, the next segment we got. Adapt or die. What do you got? You got an adapter die ready? Sure. I would love to see a uh, a play version 
of ICP and Sharon Osbourne. I think I could see it as an opera. To me, it really goes into operatic proportions with Howard Stern. And I think, I think you have Jackie the Joke Man, perhaps, or was it Artie Lang at that point? I think Jackie the Joke Man was still there. And Robin as kind of the, the Greek chorus there. I, I want to see an opera version of their meeting there on the Howard Stern show. It's almost like a trial of Socrates with Howard Stern as the judge and a battle between those two sides. Fair enough, fair enough. Schizotic, you got anything you want to add? Any uh, adapt or die? Um, documentary of overseas uh, things. <laughs> that would be cool, Just yeah. Anything they do overseas, I want to see it. Well, Heck yeah. No, that we'll would be, be able to document when they tour China. <laughs> True story. That's going to be your job. I like that. I would be very interested in seeing that too because they talked about it a little bit, but it looked like there's good times and bad times, and I'd like to see more of that too. So for my That's adapt or die, I would have to say that probably one of the things that was most surprising about me, because uh, like I said, I think, and I didn't get to expand upon this enough, is their take on fame, but he went on for a long time talking about how when he finally got his own house and moved out to the country, juggalos were breaking into his house all the time to steal stuff and hanging out and hiding in the bushes. And so, I mean, everybody deals with that in fame, I guess. It kind of sucks to get trespassers and overzealous fans kind of, kind of getting up in your face. So my thought for the adaptation would be he's trying to do a crib style, uh, you know, cribs or lifestyles of the rich and famous tour of his house. But then like every once in a while, somebody pops out of the bushes asking for an autograph and he has to beat him down or people are popping out of his closet. Like, you know, he's like, what the hell not again? I just thought it would be kind of a funny take on the cribs slash lifestyles of the rich and famous thing because they always show everything looking nice and happy and check out my cars but he's not showing the part where it's like damn it there's people trying to steal my shit out of my house and so that's the one that immediately pops to my mind something like that well i mean did did you julia did were you were you were you in the was it before before you joined the going through pages rock and roll book club the same thing happened with Tony Iommi, where people kept breaking into his house. Now, he was on a massive amount of coke. Actually, he was on just the perfect amount of cocaine at the time. And so it's hard to tell because he was clearly out of his head. But he basically concluded that someone was living in his attic for like weeks at a time. That's what he says. I don't necessarily believe it, but that's what he says as well. It really freaked him out. And to that end, you could add that to the adapt or die thing. It's like, he just throws in weird shit. Like, here's the clown I got living in my basement tied up to the, you know, I think like he could have, I could see Violent J having a lot of fun with a crib style adaptation of this. That would be hilarious. But I do need to ask, did you watch the Weekly Freakly? I have not gotten around to it yet. No, no. What's, what do you got? What's the uh, Weekly okay. Freakly about? Because basically uh, towards the end, they have Chris Henson. Is that his name? Yeah, going Hansen, through yeah. Violin J's house and going room by room and just like, yeah, it's pretty funny. Oh, cool. Just going through yeah, his stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, so this is what I get. I'm behind on my, my, my media, so you're on it. I got to catch up with this. So that's a plug for that. All right. So we'll move on to the next segment, which would, of course, be... How does it compare to the Decemberists? So how does this compare to the Decemberists? That's pretty hard because if we're talking about when this book came out, it came out in 2003, which was the year that the second best Decemberist album, Her Majesty, came out. Their second full-length album, an 8.2 on, pitch, on Pitchfork. So, I mean, that was a hard year to top. But I will say, overall, it's a tie. This is our first tie that we've had on the Decemberists versus this book. Both of these are some of my favorite things that they have done. So, on to our next segment, which is... Could DJ B.O. spin this? What do you got, B.O.? Um, yeah, you know, well, we did go through it in the Going Through Pages Rock and Roll Book Club. I would love to, you know, I could, you know, the, the audio, as we, something we talked about for the first half of the book, the audio version is great. I would love to, um, I would highly recommend people check out the audio book version of it with Violent J reading it. And so I recommend that. And uh, as a DJ, I could spin that. All right. 
So then that brings us back to another point is for all three of us here, how many hatchets would you give this hatch, half of the book and how many hatchets are you giving the book overall? Go ahead. Well, Julia, what about you? This many. Five hatchets. No shame in the game, as B.O. would say. You love it. And again, this many. This many for the second half of the book. Uber fan there for giving us an Uber. You're just in math class. You should be able to figure that out, Dan. I can't do that math. Captain of the Math Club team in eighth grade, but ninth grade, that that was when the downfall kept kicking in. What do you got, Brian? What's your rating on this? I, I, I would say, I mean, look, I, I, overall, I love this book. I really do. I would, I would maybe give the second half a slightly lower score. I would give it 4.5 hatchets. Okay. But overall, I would still give this book five hatchets. It's one of, I don't want to say it's my, it's not my favorite rock and roll book of all time. But it's in the top 10%. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, and I would recommend this book to someone who is a I, ICP fan for sure. And I would recommend it to people who are not ICP fans who want to understand what the hell is going on as well. Right on. So that pretty much gets to, to, to my point too, um, is that this was for me, I haven't read as many rock biographies as you have, but this goes into my top five. This goes up there with uh, Levon Helm, Miles Davis, who Miles Davis is one is still probably the only autobiography I've ever read where I liked the person less after I read it. <laughs> that just, you just stole what I've always said about that. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm messing with you. He was not a good guy on that. I just had to steal that one from you. But no, it's true though. I did not like him very much after that book, but still top five. Um, I would say Violent J's book is in the top five here. Now on the last episode, I gave it, uh, I gave the book, I think at that point, three and a half stars. I gave this, the first half of the book was three and a half stars. The second half of the book just comes down to three stars. It wasn't quite as cool of a story, but the anecdotes and the kind of, like you said, the kind of happy ending to it uh, was still, it was still, the, I really liked that they came back after his dark period and said, you know what? I'm looking back, I'm getting all teary eyed and wistful. It was, it was, it shows a little bit more than the, it, it shows a little bit more nuance than we would expect from Violent J given just listening to the discography, at least at the, to, up to that point. And so, yeah, so overall book three and a half, so seven stars out of 10, but three and a half hatchets here. It's probably in the top five uh, of my favorite rock biographies. Yeah, so we got that. Uh, Schizotic, do you guys have anything to push or anything to promote? Because we got some, uh, we got a lot of, uh, it sounds like y'all got a lot of insane clown posse related stuff going on there in Shanghai soon. Uh, yeah, we are going to do a juggalo week. Jungle Juggalo Week, November 17th, 17th to the 20th. Jung, it's Jungwa Juggalo Week, and Jungwa is China in Chinese. Very cool, very cool. And so the, seven, the number 17 obviously has a, plays a big part in uh, Juggalo and ICP mythology, but it's also happens to be Juggalo Day is November 17th. So I look, I look forward to seeing how y'all do with that. That should be an exciting event. Uh, Bio, you got anything to plug? Uh, check out Artger, A-R-T-G-E-R, -E for all my Mongolia-related content. You can find Artger on YouTube, Billy Billy, um, and elsewhere. Um, come say hi to me when I DJ around Shanghai. And um, I don't know. There's other stuff, but that's fine for now. Dan, what's going on with you on November 17th? I don't know. I'm still trying to put together what is Juggalo Day going to look like on an island where a very, very, very small percentage of people know what Juggalos are, what know what ICP is. We'll see. I don't have my radio show anymore, sadly. It's a thing of the past. I'm, I'm, I'm brewing on it. I'm, I'm, I'm marinating on it. I'm marinating on it. But as far as things I got to plug, I will plug aspects of our show of course we got a mixed cloud mixcloud.com slash the road to shangri-la pod we got an instagram instagram.com slash the road to shangri-la pod and of course if you want to email us you can email us at the road to shangri-la pod at gmail.com i think i finally got it right it took me how many episodes before i actually like pulled up all the stuff and got it ready yeah you know, i was like nah still still subpar still subpar I what, what's your next Dan? Uh, I was going to say my next thing, of course, is my own personal 
mission to rate every single roadie in Grenada, we got a uh, Instagram.com slash Grenada roties to go to follow me on there. If you want to see what it is that I love to eat, one of my favorite foods ever and my mission to try every single one of them here in the Island of Grenada. So that's pretty much all I got. Any words? Uh, to Thank you very on? much. Thank you very much, Jillian Logue, for the logo. And thank you for our listeners. And thank you very much to our one and only top fan, Julia, a.k.a. Schizotic. And uh, thank you very much, Dan, the shit man in the Caribbean. And uh, for Julia Schizotic, for cool school DJ Danny Fitz. Oh, my God. It makes me cringe to even say that. <laughs> It's so and cool. Myself, cool school. KBO saying Dara Otsi. The end.